first reader tonight is Phyllis Katz, who is um, willing to share her birthday with us today. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we'll do that later. <laughs> she will read poems from her third collection, Finding Ithaca, in which she's written about her late husband, Arnie, who we all miss, about his death, his illness and his death, and her grief and her healing. Um, she's both a poet and a class classicist, and that is reflected in this wonderful new book. Uh, Phyllis received her BA from Wellesley College and her MA from University of California and her PhD from Columbia University and taught for many years um, at Dartmouth. <coughs> her poems have appeared in many journals, including the New England Anthology, Bloodroot um, Literary Magazine, and Salon. And she won the Oberon Poetry Prize for her poem, Emily Dickinson's Gorgeous Nothings. A longtime resident of, Phil of Norwich, Phyllis now lives in Western Massachusetts, but we're glad to be able to reel her in for events like this. <laughs> and then when she's done reading, uh, Baron Wormser will present uh, biographical essays from his new book, Legends of the Slow Expo. I can't say that fast. <laughs> Legends of the Slow Explosion: Eleven Modern Lives. He's the author of 15 books, including the novel, the new novel, uh, Tom of Vietnam, which you may also hear about this evening. And um, the memoir that I think I knew him first about was The Road Washes Out in the Spring. Um, he's been the Poet Laureate of the State of Maine and received fellowships from numerous, numerous organizations, including the NEA and the uh, Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Byrne grew up in Baltimore. He went to um, uh, Baltimore City College and to uh, John Hopkins University and did graduate studies also at the University of California, um, but in Irvine and the University of Maine. And he currently teaches uh, throughout the United States and currently lives in Montpelier. So without further ado, please help me welcome this evening's guests. And is this going to be the right height for uh, me? Nope. Uh, <laughs> You're taller than I am. <laughs> OK. Try that. OK. Can everybody hear me? No. No, no. you got to get closer. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, closer. <laughs> there you go. Um, first of all, I want to say how delighted I am to be back in the Upper Valley. I now live in the Pioneer Valley, <laughs> which is uh, a bit down the highway. I live in Northampton, Mass. I miss being a Vermonter very, very much. And I come back when I can. And here I am. Uh, I'm delighted to have so many of my friends here. Okay, better? Okay, good, all right. I want to tell you a little bit about how I'm going to read this book because I'm going to do it a little differently than I usually do in that this is in a way a memoir, a poetic memoir, and it has a th some, some, some themes that make it work. So I'm going to read you little quotations that are part of the, the different sections of this book because they help to set the changes and, and the scenes. Uh, just one word about the cover of this book. It is a 19th century painting by an Irish painter who was traveling around Greece and made a painting of Ithaca. Mm -hmm. and, and who knew? I found it on the web. It was in the public domain. And it was just right for this book. So I'm very happy about that. Can you still hear me in the back? OK. Thank you all for coming, so many of my friends. It's just such a tr treat for me. So there are seven sections to this book. And each one of them has a, an epigram from either Kavathi's Ithaca, poem Ithaca, or guess who? The Odyssey, because uh, this poem is about finding Ithaca. So the f I'm going to read the, the, the little epigraphs, because I think they set the scene for what I'm trying to do in this book. So part one is called The, the Way Home. And the, the epigraph is Lastragonians, Cyclops, and wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. And that's from Kavafi. So the first poem I'm going to read is called East of Thebes. And this is kind of the key poem for, for what, what I try to do in this book about, of poetry about the way history from everywhere is part of who we are. So this poem is called East of Thebes. This is where it begins. 
where things that's fine. I'll start again. <laughs> East of Thebes, this is where it begins, where things begin unbidden. Grow from food we do not know we are eating, where events of the past are outside our geography, our present time. This is how it begins, in silence, in secret, something growing inside us we do not know is ours, cannot see or feel where it came from, where we were or who we are. We are east of Troy, of Athens, of Thebes, Jerusalem, or Rome, ourselves begun in histories we have not lived, that shape us, mark us. Fall of Troy, Odysseus's journey home to Ithaca, defeat of Byzantium, Carthage's ruins plowed into the soil, the Crusades, the Reformation, the list goes on and on. This is how it begins, without maps, guidance, or directions times and places and events we did not live. Define us, help us to find where we are going from where we think we never were, east of Thebes. So this is the first section, which is called The Way Home. And the first poem I'm going to read from this section is called, Lo second poem, Lost Homecoming. In the early eight years of his disease, he was struck down, nearly died, but he came back. Now my blood runs hot. Thoughts explode to fragments, seep into one another. I have lost him. I am a drought waiting for rain. The spring-fed water in the pond is sinking. The heron that comes to feed from time to time on hapless frogs has spread its gray wings and gone to look for clearer water. Our home magnet, however powerful, pull crooked as our years went by. Once I could follow a pattern, sew a simple dress or shirt. Now the twisted, fa twisted fabrics of my life cannot be seen together. Some internal compass brought Odysseus home to Ithaca after years of pain, both given and received, his spouse perhaps unfaithful, his dog grown old with waiting. Servant girls abused, par palace larder empty. Here, tracks of the fisher make a sequence of twos, front, front hind, front hind. He chases the porcupine, wears it out, and kills it. My body and mine do not join. Like Penelope at night, I unravel the day I have knit. My dreams are puzzles I cannot put together from stories I do not know. Chipmunks and squirrels gather nuts against the winter. Bears gorge on apples and berries. Hummingbirds fight for nectar before a long journey. My pantry shelves are empty. I open my mouth to speak, but no words come. The phone rings and rings. I pick it up. No one is there. It is the time of goldenrod, etching fields along the road. Maple leaves are beginning to turn orange and red. They know how to fall. I don't remember the way home. So the second section is called Journey Over, and the epigraph is from Odyssey, book 11. Uh, and um, it, it, it just talks about death, really. No longer do tendons hold fast flesh and white bones when a mighty fire ignites and burns you, and your fluttering soul flies away like a dream. Sorry, I have these poem's mark, but, okay. This poem is called Where the Dead Are. What is left behind does not negate the dying or the grief, and yes, there is a presence in the absence that haunts and hurts. In our minds, our loved ones reappear at our empty ta table, ride next to us on the train, wake us in the night with a tender touch, comfort us when our lives go wrong. But dark tree limbs hold me, imprisoned at a crossroad. He would tell me there is always a passage up from loss, sweetness of the pomegranate, bitterness of its fruit, of its juice. Yes, the dead are always with us, a belief that may bring consolation, but does not warm an empty bed. And this is again from the, the same section. It's called Frozen. The years are shivering in my bones, rhyme gnawing at my hips, hoarfrost biting feet that once danced on pond ice for hours, 
hand warmers and extra socks unthinkable. I know now the same cold he felt, always chilled, despite his downlined shirt, wool sweater, winter underwear. I think today of Dante's ninth circle, sinners plunged in ice, torment worse than fire. How the poet journeyed down and rose again to warmth and light, to paradise. I don't hope for that, just a time for a time of warming, a pause from grief before I am all ice. And section th slower? Okay, thank you. Section three is called Grief. And the epigraph again is from the Odyssey. This is time book 10. It's about death. Their dear hearts were broken, weeping they tore their long flowing hair. But what benefit can come from te tears? Homer knew a lot. <laughs> Okay, so the first poem <laughs> is one that some of you who lived on New Boston Road will recognize. It's called Rattled. The house down the road from us, empty for years, exploded without warning. Around its foundations, only pieces of wood and metal remained. Insulation hung from the trees, boards flew onto a neighbor's roof, the windows shattered and fell, shards of glass gleaming on scorched grass. Some said the cause was a propane leak. Most would have it so. I think the house had been empty too long and just let go. <laughs> okay. Um, what the river carries. He never wanted the dark of the ground, headstone with his name, plot neglected and forgotten as the years went past by. He preferred the heat of fire, compact completeness of the burning, his ashes carried down the river that we loved, and after him our ginger cat and last Springer Spaniel. Now they swim together, carried slowly downward, safe in the water's currents, floating toward the river's mouth and their union with the sea. And the next one is called One, One Harbor Reached. After months of sorting and culling, multiple trips to U-Haul, visits from Recover to take away what could not be kept, after days of children choosing pieces of our homes, pictures, photo photographs, memorabilia, after the packing, the back and forth journeys to store what would be kept, decisions of what to give away or trash, after the final run through, heavy snow, wet footprints on our carefully protected floors, after the two vans had swallowed what was going, filled with the leftovers of our lives, after the truck was filled and left, I walked one more time through the last of our nine homes and felt a rough wind blowing through the empty rooms, filling them with lost longings. After I checked to be sure, no traces or tracks of us could be found by the new owners. In the back of his closet, hidden under an empty forgotten box, I found a bent and crumbled paperback copy of our old Odyssey and thought of all the rich and varied journeys we, have ta we had taken together. He now safe in his Ithaca, I still on my way. Okay, so the next section four is called the healing power of song. And the epigraph again is from the Odyssey, the gods gave death to mankind so there may be song for those to come. I love that quotation. And it makes these poems about writing poetry not an ars poetica, but, but a reaction to loss and grief. Uh, all right, let's see, what have I got here? All right, um, birding and mending. Buttons and keyboards are difficult to master now, but I am still able to focus my binoculars, capture the gorgeous plumage of the South African lilac-breasted roller, glimpse a merlin flying far above the trees, can find tiny kinglets darting in high branches, identify the tap-tap-tapping of each woodpecker, closing my ears to honks and screeches of the ordinary world listening instead to the trilling or buzz of warblers, the urgent, here I am, where are you, of the red-eyed vireo, the whistling tea kettle, tea kettle of the Carolina wren, beginning again to find poems. Uh, 
I'm going to read one that some of you have heard before because I think I did it in our, our poetry group, but it's called Fall Line at Sabine Woods, Fall Out at Sabine Woods. And a fallout, I think many of you know, is when birds have come often across the Gulf to, into Texas and they've had hit a lot of bad weather. So as soon as they get to land, they all come down at once. And it's just an amazing sight to see all these birds everywhere on the floor, on the ground, and on the trees. So there, here's my reaction to the fallout at Sabine Woods. When the great thun storm thundered off the coast, oh, then I knew the rain would batter thousands flying from South America over the Gulf of Mexico to summer breeding grounds. These small songbirds tossed by wind, pounded by water, knew that some would not reach safety in the waiting forest. When the wind and deluge turned away, I walked into the trees and found hundreds of survivors dropped onto the ground or perched glistening in dark, wet leaves. Tanagers, buntings, grosbeaks, reds, oranges, blues, and yellows, like blossoms, lit the woods. Oh, how they touched my sodden spirit, taught me to keep flying through a wilderness of loss and grief. Okay, and a couple of poems about coming back to poetry. Uh, the first one is called Tractate, after Brenda Hillman, who's quite a well-known poet. And, and this is about trying to write again, really, that I needed to let go. There were too many words that the secret lay in the spaces between the lines. And I cast them off, those words, and gave them no life jacket, no boat. And I could see them sink in a lake, lake of mud, their little mouths gra gasping. And a voice said, not all, no, not all of us. You must dig down into the mud, find the buried shells, find the ones that are alive. And this next poem is called My Songs. Once there was a song inside me, fierce and hot, planted so deep that its fire burned, never went out. But another song came, filled with loss, grew and had its way with me, so that I slowly turned to frost, then ice, and my fire went out. Once I sang for love, but he could not stay. A new song took my love away. My fire went out, and frost moved in, and my hands shut into fists and could not warm. Once I had no song, no fire, no love, and I walked on a path to nowhere without air. Once I was cold and my hands were fists and I could not hear a voice that rose in the swirling mist both far and near, but still it sang and grew till it touched the sun where it lit a new fire bright and warm and called me to wake and my hands let go and a new song came louder calling me back, singing my name, no longer wild, no longer hot, for the fire was gone, but love was not, for it lived in my heart and would not die, was there in the morning, alive at night, companion in me, dark and light. And my songs began to sing a new life. And the next section is called Necessity. And the, and the epigram is, you're a locust, you yourself can stay here, eating and drinking by the dark ship. But I, for my part, are driven by mighty necessity. And that's Odysseus insisting to go on when some of his crew doesn't want to. They've had enough trouble. So um, the next poem I'm going to read is called The Lesson of the Map Maker. Map Maker. And one of the reasons I'm reading this poem is that it was a pa there's a passage in Moby Dick, uh, Mel Melville's Moby Dick, called the, about the lesson of the ma about the map maker, and it was my one of my husband's favorite passages of all literature. And in it, Ishmael who's the, often the, the storyteller of, of, the, Mel, of the Moby Dick, uh, is watching a member of the crew fen, um, s sewing the rips in the this, in this, in this, in sails. And he uses this metaphor for the, the weaving in and out of the, of the different parts of the, of, the, of the work he's doing as standing for uh, the different strains stand for um, chance, free will, and, and necessity, which are the three things that we can think about that d drive our life as to we sometimes things come to us, we choose them, sometimes chance, and sometimes we do what we have to do. So this is my poem called Lesson of the Map Maker. 
His ancestors fled Russia and Poland, the fire and fury of the Cossacks, because they had to, because they could, because they dared to take a chance. Mine left Britain, where work was scarce, water was imminent, abandoned their homeland, risked the U-boats, sailed across the cold, rough sea in steerage to find a better life. When Lusitania went down off the coast of Ireland, my grandmother and her daughters, my mother four, her sister six, had been waiting in Liverpool to board it on its return voyage to New York. They escaped the shock of the torpedoes, lifeboats that could not launch, terrors of that swift downward plunge to the sea's bottom, though fear traveled with them when they boarded the next available ship, knowing they too might be struck. I'm going to skip a little bit from this passage because I don't want to, I'm almost out of time. Uh, but you can read it in the book, all the, <laughs> all the pieces that are missing. Uh, so section C, uh, six is called Peace, and I'll read one from that and then one from the last section. Uh, the one from Peace is called Inside Out. The soul, and it's a, it begins with an epigraph from Emily Dickinson. The soul has moments of escape when bursting all the doors, she dances like a bomb abroad and swings upon the hours. Sometimes my mind is a prison cell where I pace for hours, window too high up for sight, escape impossible. All I can see are doubts and indecisions. All I can hear are the footsteps of my mistakes. Then the heavy door opens and my mind flies out from its thick walls with volcanic force, transformed into a spirit I thought had disappeared and left me locked inside. Inside the hours are solid, heavy, do not move. Outside, my spirit opens through trees and sky, beyond minutes, hours, days. Time for a time has no hold. My soul swings free. Okay, um, the last section is called What Ithaca Means. The um, epigram is from Kavafi, and it's uh, the last line of the poem, Ithaca. And it says, and if you find her poor, Ithaca will not have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. So just one little poem from, from this one. And I will have reached my timing. <laughs> what to take as you go. Take a basket of apples, loaf of warm bread, the cry of a baby, a bottle of water. Take the sweat of sheets after love, timbre of someone's last breath, the giggling of children, the soft hush of waves on quiet sand. Walk like you are on your way to a gathering of saints. Take their names to write on your slate. Throw away your compass. Take the songs of the hermit thrush and the winter wren. Memorize them and play them in your heart. Do not measure the distance between going and arriving. Sing a march, a hymn, a cantata, note for note. Bind your eyes, plug your ears, feel the sound of your feet, follow where they lead. Thank you all for listening. What wonderfully moving poems. Let me just, you're a little bit taller. A little bit. So, try that. Okay. Okay, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and to be reading with Phyllis, with whom I go back to the days of uh, Donald Sheehan. That's right. Uh, I'm um, in a bit of a, a different uh, predicament as a writer in that um, I have had two books come out in the last six months. So um, what it was always like, the sort of Irish twins for, uh, for a writer. So, um, so I'm going to read a bit from the, the first. It's sort of like children. I don't want to neglect the, uh, the eldest. Um, so I'm going to read a bit from uh, the book that came out first, which is a novel. It's actually very fitting to be reading um, with Phyllis tonight. Her book uh, clearly is haunted by the Odyssey. Uh, my novel, Tom of Vietnam, is haunted uh, by uh, King Lear, my character is a, a Vietnam veteran in 1982 
who carries King Lear around with him. It is his Bible, basically. Uh, the novel is a road novel uh, going from Santa Fe to Washington, D.C. And um, I'm just going to uh, pick it up here uh, in uh, Ohio. Uh, so it's a series of, of bus rides. Uh, and um, Tom, who is a guy named Tom, and also Tom a Bedlam um, is, uh, you know, on the way to, uh, to Washington. After I get my duffel and after a mild hassle about my ticket, because I got off the bus, but after I explain and gesticulate that I had an emergency, I'm five rows back on the driver's seat beside an older woman who's knitting something pink. How are you today, son? I have a lot of unresolved grief about shooting a girl in a war, along with self-hatred, but otherwise, I'm fair to middling, <laughs> trying to put my life together and a bunch of other cliches. Thanks for asking. And I'm older than you may think. Well, I'm Sally Johnson. My friends call me Johnny. That's funny, isn't it? A boy's name. And my heart goes out to you, son. She stops her knitting and looks at me. That's a nice jacket you have there. Thanks. And what war was it, she asks. Her voice is peaceful and almost speculative. Vietnam. I didn't pay that war much attention. I know it was a big deal, but I don't follow the news much. I'll tell you one thing, though. Wendell Wilkie was a good-looking man. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell Wilkie, huh? You get as old as I am, and it seems as if you've seen it all. She sighs. I feel like that too, I say. War is a hard thing, she says. Young boy is dying. She keeps on knitting. What's that you're knitting? I ask. It's going to be a sweater for my granddaughter, Carolyn. That's where I'm headed, to Lima, Ohio, where she lives with her mom, Carrie and her dad, Joe. She chuckles. They're quite the pair, Carrie and Joe, what you'd call live wires. I make a humming telegraphic sound. I, too, wish I could graze in the fields of regularity. Time would milk me each day. I'd give forth a pail's worth of self-satisfaction. The seasons would pass the way they were intended to pass. I'd be almost biblical. Tom the Revelator. I exhale hard. You got a cough there, son? I've got some cough drops in my purse. Johnny puts her knitting down, pulls up a voluminous bag from the bus floor, and begins to paw through it. Comes back to me how much I used to like to suck on cough drops when I was a boy. They probably were pure sugar. Somehow I felt I was doing something good for, for myself. I take one from Johnny and begin to suck. I guess it's too bad we have to have these wars, she says. The Germans were terrible people. Imagine someone being like Hitler. A little termite, that's what my late husband called him. She looks down at the pink, whatever it is she's knitting. She shakes her white head of little permed curls. He that will think to live till he be old, give me some help. Well, you keep knitting there, Johnny. I'm going to take a snooze. I didn't get much sleep last night. Tossing and turning, son? Yeah, a lot of tossing and turning. Her neat little mouth 
makes a neat little smile. Sympathy goes forth a little ways, then bows to the non-existent audience. I close my eyes, but the scenario remains. Everyone is employed gainfully in the sense-making capacity while I'm standing in the wings waving a battered copy of a battering play. I see myself sitting in some old theater from the last century and watching actors dressed up in their robes and finery declaiming and gesticulating. Their voices reach the heavens. There still were heavens to reach. I fall asleep. It's Lima, I hear Johnny say. Ah, Lima, Ohio, home of, famous for, birthplace of, settlers first, coming soon, in this location, the oldest living, state champions. Every unspecial place is special. <laughs> you might as well love America because it doesn't know any better. <laughs> it's all good. Even the bad is good. Love us, love our wars. Don't be bitter, Tom. Why not? You take care of yourself, son. Don't take any wooden nickels. Johnny winks at me. I wonder what I was dreaming about when Lima appeared. I've had the nightmares on the bus. Private hell in a public space. I look out the window at what passes for a bus station. One of the chaplains I talked about said to me one morning when we were admiring some landscape that hadn't been blown up or defoliated, that God didn't cut corners when he made the earth. He left it to the human race to cut corners, though the chaplain never would have said that. Johnny gives me a jolly wave as she steps down from the bus. She's done her part. She's got some knitting to show for it, too. Maybe you need a hobby, Tom, something to take your mind off your troubles. Maybe I could rig up a little theater in one of my sister's cellars and make figures out of wood and do King Lear to my heart's sad content. As my ideas go, it's not the worst one. Maybe to start with, I need my own cellar. Though owning anything big bothers me. Me and my duffel. Me and my shadow. Me and my memory. Trying to lift my insubstantial weight. But thou dost breathe has heavy substance. Okay, so that's what I'm going to read uh, from Tom tonight. Um, the second book, uh, which came out last month, is this book, Legends of the Slow Explosion. These are biographical pieces um, of different people from the second half of the 20th century, um, focus a lot on the 1940s and 1950s, people who emerge one way or another from that time. The people are very different, but the, the idea with each person is that the life basically tells you something legendary about being a human being, the way the Odyssey tells us something uh, legendary uh, about being, you know, Odysseus. Um, so I'm going to read from the first one, uh, which is uh, Rosa Parks. Where it started was uncertain. There was Africa. There were the ships. There was the auction block, 12 bucks for sale, ages 12 to 20, and two wenches. There were thousands of wombs available to the master and his sons. There was the dinner table. Past the bread, past the butter, past the Negroes who are as much our property as the bread and butter, past the complaints about how shiftless they are, past the complacency that enables us to sit here and not think twice, past Senators Sparkman and Hill 
and their stentorian predecessors, past the iced water, past the state's rights, past this damned heat so it leaves the room, past the Bible that sanctions slavery, past those biscuits that Aunt Mary made, she makes the best biscuits, past the filibuster, past the birthright that is fate, born mewling and shrieking, past the whip, past the River Jordan, past the occasional kindness, past the way of life, past the mistress of the house, staring into a disconsolate mirror. Behind the path to the cabins, behind the preacher's sermon, behind the voices raised to heaven, behind the woman struggling with humiliation, indignity, and viciousness, a Montgomery, Alabama public transit bus heaved into sight with its human freight, white and black, coming home from work. They sat in their designated areas, whites up front, blacks in the middle, until more whites appeared when they had to move to the rear of the bus, which was the black area. If whites needed a seat, the driver would tell a black person to move. That was the law. The driver was an officer of the law and carried a gun. Everyone had to respect the law. If people did not respect the law, the world as Montgomery knew it would end. There is that weight of how things are here. Everyone is born into that weight and that weight becomes part of who a person is. The weight can be favorable on account of your skin color or not favorable. The weight is larger than just one person. So any one voice is more than one person speaking. Everything concerns the weight, especially when the weight becomes a code. There were water fountains for white and colored but the colored fountain did not have colored water. Colored meant people. It wasn't, however, just the physical indignities, to say nothing of cruelties, but the mental ones that made the weight so vast. The weight was like one big mind that went everywhere every moment and never slept. The weight was a power that could strike at any time. You could be minding your own business, but you had no own business. The weight owned your thoughts, or at least tried to. A child was bound to ask about why she couldn't go up to a certain fountain, but had to use another one. A child was bound to say that it made no sense, and the adult was bound to look at the child and wonder how to explain. The adult was bound to wonder why she or he brought the child into a world filled with such soul-killing prohibitions. Perhaps the adult gripped the child's hand a bit more tightly and said, that's the way it is. Perhaps the child heard in the voice a regret that no smile could absolve. Perhaps that tight grip almost hurt. Everyone knew Rosa Parks was a serious, dignified Christian woman. A serious, dignified Christian woman who wasn't fit to take her own seat on a bus and stay there regardless of whoever else got on the bus. But everyone meant black folks, not those white folks to whom Rosa Parks was just another Negro to say nothing of the common epithet. She wasn't a real person, but the coordinates of a few centuries of bad history.
Everyone had learned to live with that bad history. That was what the bus was about. Some people actually celebrated the history. They had their pride and let everyone know it. If only they had won that war. Others, the unreal Negroes, simply had to live with it and take what they could, which was plenty in the way that being on the earth and sharing the earth with other people could be plenty. No pity need apply. But even the greatest vitality and love would have to move for the bus driver. A person, black or white, could wonder about what sort of God blessed the circumstances of history. A person could wonder what God saw if he saw anything. A person could wonder whether God was blind, loving and kind, no doubt, but blind. When the bus boycott began in Montgomery after Rosa's refusal to move and her arrest, very few white folks, most of whom presumably were churchgoers, stood up for the Negroes. There were some, like the woman who directed the library and who was vilified for her support and killed herself not long after. If you stepped out of line, you could pay a pariah's price. According to all manner of doctrine, people had free will despite the constraints people put on other people. Above that less than edifying spectacle, God resided in his appointed heaven, <coughs> and Rosa had faith in that God, if not explicitly in that heaven. You needed the buttress of spirit to stand up to what was determined to belittle you. The Negro ministers called upon the buttress of God day and night. Their exhortations filled and enlivened the mute air. But the librarian lady fell down. She was in a congregation of what may have seemed like one. The God of the white churches offered consolations that apparently were not for everyone. The librarian's demise might have been called a tragedy, but that word did not apply to history. That word came from some other ancient world, not an American one. Any little human life was just that, a little human leaf on the very big current of history, to say nothing of destiny. No one could see a leaf going down the Mississippi. You could see a person go under, or you heard about it, but plenty of people went under. Routinely, Negroes were murdered, and nothing was done about it. The lives of Negroes were more like weeds in the eyes of those who controlled history. You could pull a weed and throw it aside, and that was the end of it. Rosa easily could have gone under too. Rosa easily could have been tossed aside. A diet of loathing makes for some thin people. There was much pep and cheering from the white folks, waving pennants at the sugar bowl and the cotton bowl, finding religion in football, acting like grown-up children. Imagine all the real trouble in the world, and there they were, people getting worked up about a game. The shouting, though, the amplitude they prided themselves on never made the white folks any larger. They stayed thin, their spirits starved, living on a ghostly animus, their self-respect tied overtly or covertly to denying the right to the same schools and books, their every motion and word, a contrivance to which they held on to for unhappy, if accustomed, life. Everything was feeding white folks their banks and their land and their colleges and their companies, but they remain lean and ever hungry. Out there in the dark nights of their heads, 
lurk the Negroes with their demands and their very being that spoke of suffering that never should have been allowed. It didn't matter how great the Virginian presidents were or how great the generals were in the war between the states. Some things weren't about greatness. They were about decency. I'm going to read one more paragraph. The Negroes lived, of course, in unnoticeable circumstances and a Negro woman was particularly unnoticeable. Then again, even if they had noticed, no white person would have asked Rosa Parks what she thought or how she felt as she went about her life as a seamstress in Montgomery. Those would have been senseless questions. To move to the back of the bus was still to be chattel, you Negroes back there. It was to be faceless and nameless, lost in the slavehold of anonymity. So to insist that you had a voice that could say something more than yes sir was as crucial an assertion as a Negro and a woman to boot could make. Acquiescence and silence went together. The beauty of uprooting that acquiescence was that all those Bible-laced speeches that emanated from the Negro churches in Montgomery, a torrent of eloquence as noteworthy as any unleashed by the orators and ministers of the 19th century, stemmed from a brief non-discussion on what purported to be a public bus. Mrs. Parks was not moving. There you had it. Thank you. <laughs>